welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. Today I am joined by Tony Mantor. He is an established and successful American singer-songwriter, pianist, podcast host, and record-charting music producer who has celebrated working in Nashville for more than 30 years. He is a native of Madison, Maine, first arriving in Nashville as a touring sideman for country music sensation Ronnie McDowell in 1976. And since then, Tony Mantor has progressed into an award-winning music producer, recording and placing 33 songs in the top 40, 16 songs in the top 10 of various U.S.-based major music charts, including Billboard, Indicator, MediaBase, Cashbox, and Music Row magazine. He's also worked with the likes of Debbie Campbell, Bobby Brooks Wilson, Happy Day star and singer Donnie Most, country artist Sam Austin, and country artist Mila Mason. One of his more recent and inspiring projects has been to make a difference in the lives of people with his song, Why Not Me? It has become an inspiration for launching his podcast um, just this month, dubbed Why Not Me? The World, which will focus on autism awareness, acceptance and understanding, and will feature one-on-one interviews with celebrity guests, subject matter experts, parents, and those who have been touched by autism. To learn more about Tony, his music, or his podcast, please visit his website, tonymantra.com, and we'll have a link in the show notes for all of you, um, all of you interested. And I just, on a personal note, I used to, I'm, I'm a board certified music therapist, and I used to work with um, kids with disabilities, some of whom had autism, and they are such wonderful people and have, you know, like such beautiful spirits. And I think that's fantastic that you have a podcast that's focused on awareness and celebration and acceptance. So that is really great. Um, if you don't mind me asking, we could just sort of start with that. Like, how is that going? And what sort of inspired you to start that? It it all started just uh, by chance. I, um, I had done a song, which was called Why Not Me? And it was and it was just uh, it had mono, kind of a country version to it, um, just a steel added into it for flavor. But people thought it was country because it had a steel in it. The people that uh, that I work with around the world wanted me to re- release it. And, and I felt that if I was going to release it, I was going to have to have something to make a reason to release it. So I did a um, a video and I paid tribute to our first responders and then. As most of my projects do, they last five, six, seven months, and then they move on. So I kind of thought it was over with. And then um, um, about a few months later, I had this lady call me up and ask me if I could do something in that kind of thing to help them. And she's a speech therapist for autistic children. So I decided that um, if we're going to do that, that I needed to re-record it in more of an adult contemporary version so not to confuse people and then do a new video and include people from the autistic world here in Nashville uh, in, in it and start building it from there. So that's kind of how it all worked. It's just uh, people ask me, why did you pick autism? And I tell people, well, autism kind of picked me. Mm-hmm. And where do you see, I know it's a brand new and budding for you, but where do you see that podcast and project in like a year say well you know the um the whole premise of why not me the world uh developed out of i put the video out and i just kind of thought that it was going to go for a while and then all of a sudden it just exploded on me i started getting people you know emailing me and and sending me messages and commenting on my social media that they loved what i was doing and i got people from all over the world and then the people that I work with over in the UK and parts of Europe, 
they their radio stations and TV and all that started interviewing me and I started doing podcasts over interviews over there and and it just kept just growing and growing and growing. And then um, when I decided to I was, I'm I'm going to work on on a project, a new video through the summer, and it's going to be called Why Not Me the World, which will feature uh, people from the autistic community around the globe in it. And then uh, I was going to do a podcast called Why Not Me, but it was going to just kind of be on, you know, talk and entertainment and and different things like that. And this just kept growing. So I felt like, you know, I need to take and make this Why Not Me the world kind of to go along with everything else I'm doing. So, you know, when you put a podcast out there or you do anything, whether you put a record out there to radio or what, it doesn't matter what you release, when you put something out there for the public to to grab a hold of and 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 hopefully they'll like it, you never know if they will or not. So when I first started this podcast, my whole my whole idea is to talk with regular people and then sprinkle in a few um, celebrities here and there that that deal with with autism and and really tell the story because I heard I, I saw so many autism podcasts and they were all very, very good. But I never saw any podcast or listened to any podcast that spent time talking with people telling their stories. So I decided that this podcast is going to be real people telling real stories. And some's going to make you're going to you're going to laugh at them and some's going they're going to tear your heart out because because there's a lot of good and there's a lot of a lot of unfortunate stories out there. But I feel that they need to be told. And the people want to tell them. So in the, I mean, I'm pre-recording my 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 uh, podcast now, and just in the last four, five, six, well, six weeks or so since I've since I put out my first podcast, uh, which is just an introduction to get on the platforms and tell people what it's about. I've had so many people come my way that I'm already booked into November. So, um, and I've already recorded about seven or eight of these people and their stories are just fantastic i mean the things that they tell tell me the the different things that that uh, they go through it's just uh it's just really inspirational on how these people live their lives and and how they go about their lives and how they how they continue to grow within themselves and in their communities so I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm just going to take and do it for as long as they want me to. And as long as people keep coming on and, and want to be part of it, then I'll just keep it going. That sounds fantastic. I definitely look forward to tuning in and I wish you all the best success with that new adventure. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, my first my first podcast is going to be um, June 28th. And it's a um, artist and a poet out of uh, out of London, and her story is just uh, really really good. She gives a lot of great stuff in it, and she's got a poem that she did uh, that tells uh, how people uh, uh, think when they're with that uh, that are autistic. It's it's just uh, really pretty inspiring. So so far it's it's been um, it's just been a true pleasure to to be talking with these people and have them telling me their stories, and and I'm hoping that uh, the people that that listen to it. If they can gain one thing out of each episode that can help them, they, or they they can hear something that they went through that they can relate to, that it will tear down some of these walls and hopefully people just feel less alone in the world. That's really great. I appreciate you sharing that with me and the listeners. And you know, we will tune in on the 28th of June. Looking forward to that. And of course, we'll put links in the show notes as well of where to find that. But we're going to backtrack a little. And I was wondering, sort of what inspired you to get on your creative path in life? When I was eight, I was just like a typical kid, you know, out playing and doing different things. And we had an old beat up piano that uh, was in our house. And I'd go over and just pretend I was whoever I wanted to be and playing on the piano and it was out of tune and and it was it was just beat up and and then um um 
then all of a sudden my my mother said well if you're gonna if you're gonna do this then um um you're going to have to learn so she went out and and um she went out and and uh, had my the piano refinished and retuned and and all that and i started taking lessons and i just did that and and kept building and then i wound up going to berkeley and and uh, it just grew from there so it just uh, j just from me wanting to just play it just turned out that uh, i loved music and loved all styles and and i just continued to develop that's wonderful. Obviously, you play piano, but I mean, are there any other instruments that you've ever wanted to try, or what do you think? I took in and, and tried different different uh, instruments, and and I do some percussion. I mean, I was snare, uh, bass, drum, cymbals, timpani, because I was in the concert band at, at times. So that was about as far as I wanted to go. And then, of course, I learned that I had a vocal and I could sing uh, when I was about I don't know. At 14, 15 years old, I started singing a little bit and it just kept de developing on that. And that's kind of my direction I took. Nice, nice. When you first moved to Nashville, and of course you've you've settled there and made a great career, um, you know, what was something that was a struggle for you at the time that you were able to overcome? Anytime that you, you move to a new area, um, you've got to learn the area, learn the people, get to know them, network. You know, there's a process that you have to go through. And I knew a couple of people moving to Nashville, you know, um, but I didn't know a bunch of people. And 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 um, the people that, that talked me into moving, which was uh, Bob Millsap and Gary Paxton, um, Bob Millsap published the song You Needed Me that Ann Murray cut. And Gary Paxton was a member of the Argyles that had a lot of hit records. So they knew a lot of people and, and they were getting ready to retire and they kind of talked me into moving down to take their place and get in the, get off the road and, and do more production development. So I did. Um, I decided, you know, after a long thought process, I decided that it'd be a good thing. I moved. And then as soon as I moved, they both kind of got sick and, and one moved out of town and, and one kind of went into his cave and, and I was kind of all by myself. And that was the, probably the best thing that happened to me because I got out there and I started creating my own network. I created my own friends and, and started building. And, and it took me a few years to do that because, because I had a five-year plan and it probably took me three or four years to get to that point of where, okay, you know, this might have a chance of working out. So from that, I just kept working and, and building and, and ultimately it uh, turned out pretty good. That's really great. And, but I am terribly curious, like, would you ever move anywhere else in the world? Like if you could, or do you, or is like Nashville, like your, your absolute favorite place? Well, you know, I've always told people, cause I'm originally from Maine and Maine's a place that you've got to want to be there because it's got a longer winter. It's got, you know, it's cold winter, uh, you know, summer's short, you know, but I grew up there and, and I love Maine. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go back here for a vacation here in the next week. Um, I've always told people that if I could do what I'm doing here in Nashville, I would have never left Maine. But unfortunately, that's not that's not really something I can do. So I do like I do like Nashville. I like the people. I like I like the area. Uh, I've got a lot of friends here now. You know, as far as to move any place to stay now, uh, I don't know. I mean, I got a lot of friends of mine that live in Florida. Um, I don't know if I want to be in Florida, um, even though it's it's nice and 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 you know the weather's always warm. There's there's wherever you go, there's always good things and always bad things. You know, so once you once you get to know the good things and what and and it's kind of hard to move away from those good things. So would I move down to to you know a warmer climate for the winter to just be you know for a couple of months? Yeah, I probably I might consider doing something like that. But just to move there and stay there, I don't see that happening. I I see myself staying in Nashville, for, you know, if, for as long as I need to. And it's a great place to go for music, you know, like Nashville, New York, L.A. You know, they they seem to be hubs for things like that. 
Well, you know, I've been in I've been in all three, you know, New York, L.A., Nashville and 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 as as much as it's good, you know, in New York and L.A., just getting around. I mean, I mean, everything like in L.A., I mean, if you as they say, as the crow flies, it could take you 10 minutes. And when I ask people, so how long is it going to take me to get here? An hour and a half. Mm. How long is it going to take me to get here? An hour and a half. It seems like every place I want to go in, in LA is an hour and a half, you know, and, and once I got there and I started working there and doing some things that, you know, different projects I've been, been a uh, part of, they were right. I mean, it seemed like it took me an hour and a half. The traffic was just, out, just crazy. And because New York city's traffic is crazy and Nashville has such a laid back atmosphere. And that's why I moved here because because when you record in Nashville, you know you you don't have that 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 uh, person watching the clock if you're five minutes over time or or you know it's it's just so laid back, and because Nashville is so laid back, people from New York, L.A., and all over the country and all over the world have moved here to do music, and Nashville used to be considered music city the music city USA. You know, I mean. I mean, uh, home of country music, and that's not the case anymore. Now, Music City USA really is Music City because you can come here and find any style of music that you want. You can find rock, you can find rap, you can find jazz, you can find pop music. And of course, country with the Grand Ole Opry and a lot of a lot of the uh, country places down on Broadway. But I mean, the atmosphere of Nashville has changed so drastically now that when you think of music, you don't think of just country anymore because it's got so much to offer. That is really great. And it's great for the artists too, because, you know, if they want to live in a, in that laid back city, they're not forced into a certain genre. They can still express themselves and do what they want and, and find those connections and success. Absolutely. I mean, the only, the only sad part about Nashville is Nashville has what we used to call Music Row. And and that was a couple, three streets that you could walk from old house to old house. And every place would have somebody that's working in the music industry in it. One house might have a publisher. The next house might have a producer. Next house might have an independent label. And then you could go, of course, the bigger, the bigger buildings, which would be your RCAs and your Warner Brothers and Sony and all the big, big labels. But there was so much small, independent things going on there. And and it was just really kind of cool. Unfortunately, now that has not gone away, but it's not like it used to be. Because, I mean, some of the iconic recording studios that like people like Paul McCartney recorded in, they've been torn down to be replaced with condos. So Nashville has, is slowly becoming what... You know, New York and L.A. has become, but we're still more laid back. We still have have uh, that uh, that integral part of the music that that you can go to and, and still deal with. But uh, it's uh, it's changed. It's changed like any other city has had to evolve. And and unfortunately, it's lost some of its appeal because of that. But as far as people coming in, as far as musicians coming in, it's still one of the places to come to to record and, and do what you want to do. So in terms of um, producing and recording and all of the creative things that you do, what is one of your favorite parts about the process and your one of your least favorite parts about the process? Well, um, my favorite part is recording. Getting the musicians in in the studio, getting the singer in the studio, creating that music, you know that that ultimately will go to radio and 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 hopefully people like and listen to and and go out and buy. That's probably the most enjoyable part is the creation of it. The least enjoyable part of it is the management side and and the the label side to where you're always having to take and and talk to to people or talk them into playing the song or or talking them into buying the artist and into their show i mean because then it's the business side it's the numbers it's the it's the 
making sure all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed and, and everything works out on the contractual side. Whereas in the studio, you don't think about any of that. You just think about the creating the, the music and, and taking that artist to that next level of their, of their music career and music performance. So that's, uh, that's something I really, truly enjoy. What is the best advice that you would give someone who wants to enter in any part of the industry that you're involved in? The, um, the advice I would, I would tell people is do their homework know what they're getting in them getting themselves into make sure that the people they work with are reputable and if they're an artist make sure that when they work with somebody as a in in production that they make sure that they get the very highest quality project they can get because there is no second choice i mean when you stop and think about it when you hear something from somebody and they and it's not good they're not, they might not listen to it a second time when it is good. So always, always make sure that the project that you present to people, whether it be a, a manager, a record label, you know, a booking agent, anything that's going to help form your career, that you make sure that what you present is the ultimate best project that you can give to them, because that makes the difference. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, in in such a competitive industry, and there's so many talented people that, you know, you really have to put your best foot forward. And, and there's not really a time for a second chance or a second introduction, even. There isn't because, because, um, I mean, I've been, I mean, like you said, this, this is a very competitive business, you know, I mean, I've I've had times I've sat down with Capitol Records and Curb and all the major labels and pitched them a song or an artist I was working on, and they would say, oh, this is really good. This is really good. But I don't know if it's any better than what I've got, but I will I could sign it, but I can't record, I can't release it or work on it for at least a year because we got all this other stuff that's lined up. So the bottom line is that, yeah, I was, I was rejected. But I wasn't rejected because if I'd wanted to sign it, we could have worked the deal. But but the thing is, is at that point in time, there's no sense in tying up an artist for a year, not knowing what's going to happen. So, um, but because of the quality, they at least was ready to make an offer. Mm -hmm. and, and if it hadn't been good quality, they would have just listened to bits and parts of the song and they would have said, no, we don't have any openings right now. And thanks for, thanks for coming in. What do you think the biggest hurdle is for people wanting to break into the business as a recording artist? Well, number one is, is having the very best project you can have because, because if you don't have the song and the project that will compete so that when whoever's listening, whoever's listening to it has to listen to it and visualize that this is capable of making it on the radio and going in the charts. If it's not that good, then that's a big hurdle. So you've got to have, that's the first thing that it starts out with. If you want to be on a record label, if you want to be at radio, the only way to get there is by having something that is so damn good that it's undeniable. Mm -hmm. And if it's that good, then at least you've got a chance of talking some sort of business structure with a label and getting out there. That makes sense. That makes sense. I'm just terribly curious. What do persons in your business think about TV shows like The Voice and American Idol? Do you think it's good for the business or does it hurt the business or indifferent? Well, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's, it's great for people wanting to get exposure. I mean, like if you go on to America's Got Talent and, and you go and you do well, you're going to get exposed to millions of people. And that could lead into hopefully some performances. But with American Idol, The Voice, you know, things of that, and even, even America's Got Talent. I mean, I've had people this come to me a few years after, after they've been on the show, still needing a deal, still needing a project. I've recorded some American Idol singers. I've had chances to record people that went high in American Idol, but didn't win it. And then five, six years, Later, they were kind of forgotten and they had to take and rebrand themselves again. So unless you get out there and you really, really make it into the top echelon of it, then 
it's not always going to be what you think it's going to be. I mean, I know, I know a, uh, a person that went fairly high on the voice and three, four, five, six months later, that person was, was singing at a VFW hall, you know, for 200 people. Doesn't mean instant success just being on these shows. So what it does is it does give exposure, but what it also does is it circumvents the getting out there, getting on the road, paying your dues, playing in front of 10 people, paying, playing in front of a thousand people, building your way up, going up and down the roads at midnight in that van with the music equipment so that you can take and, and really learn your craft. Because just learning and being coached by some of these people that that work on these on these programs don't mean that that's going to translate into a successful career. It could, and it, but but your chances are still slim, you know. So you've got to take and and get out there and perform, get out there and 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 get exposed. Because social media, you know, I mean, I know a person that's got twenty five through you know thousand followers. I know a person that's got a hundred thousand followers and when they go out and, and perform, they might have 50 to a hundred people that show up, you know, just because you have social media, big numbers doesn't mean they're going to show up just because you're on American Idol or, or any of these, any of these other ones doesn't mean that people are going to show up and, and sit in the seats and, and pay to see you. You've got to build and, and grow and develop your talent so that while you're doing it, people are following you, they're liking you, they're buying into it, and then and then you've got a, a lifelong fan. And if you do that enough times where you've got a lifelong fan, then all of a sudden you're selling out arenas and you're and you're you're doing well. That is really interesting to hear. I mean, I've never been one to want to be a music performer at all, but um I have such admiration for people who who choose that, you know, music performance or, you know what have you it, it's such a difficult life it really is whether it's on a classical end or on a sort of a pop commercial end it is i mean people don't unless you hit unless you and even when you hit the big time okay bruno mars was out there um and i was talking with his father one time and they were doing a tour that took them up to they started out someplace in texas i can't remember where and then they wound up coming up to Nashville, Louisville. They went to North Carolina, South Carolina, Atlanta. And then they wrapped around. And they did this all within like 10 days. Mm. I mean, they made a ton of money, you know. And But believe me, they were worn out. I mean, they were tired. They had, they had just been on a 10-day excursion that was not, you know, all fun and games. It was there to do the performances. And like... Like uh, one one night they were they were in Nashville one night and the next night it was in Louisville and then I think they had a day off and they were in North South Carolina South Carolina the next day and then a day off and then then in Atlanta and it all started down in Texas. People don't see they the most people they see the videos they see the documentaries where they're traveling from here to here and here they they're in front of. 20, 25,000 people. They see all, all the, the glory of it, but they never see the in the trenches work that has to go into it in order to make it. And it's a lot, a lot of effort. And, and you've got to really love what you're doing. So I would tell people that if, if they really, really want to take and make a name for themselves, that they're going to have to take and realize that there's a lot of effort, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of nights that that's that's going to be sleepless. And it's not going to be, it's just what it's not. It's not like the movies. Yeah, that is a good thing to remember because yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, misconceptions and glorification where you where you know everything looks like glitz and glamour and fame and. Um, obviously it takes a lot of hard work to get to the top and to stay at the top and, you know, stay on top of your game musically and with the choreography and all of that. So, yeah. And, and, and not only that, but people tend to, to tend to um, not realize that making it to the top, just because you've made it to the top and and it looks like you're, you're selling out stadiums and, and it's looked like you're doing really well. There's still a lot of, not real life that has to go into that. Um, and, and 
it's a it's a tough life. I mean, I mean, a friend of mine we're talking just this morning about, uh, and and it happened. Uh, an Elvis song came on the radio, and, and they just started talking about Elvis. And he's one of the he's one of the perfect examples of a, of a guy that that had it all, mm-hmm. but yet, would you want to have been, lived his life? You know, because because in the glory days it was it was glorious, and he made a ton of money. And I think when he died back in seventy seven, he was worth like fifty million. So if if you take fifty million back then to what fifty million is today, I mean that's like a billion, you know, I mean, it's a lot of money, you know, for back then, but I mean, he had a tough, tough life, you know, it, it was, it was uh, full of, of ups and downs and, and, you know, couldn't do something because, because his fame had, had become so famous. He couldn't do anything, you know, by himself. He had to buy out theaters in order to just go, go see a movie. I mean, there's a lot of things that you give up, you know, in order to have that kind of fame. And do you really want to give that up? There's, there's one thing that said, you know, for a lot of people that work the nine to five Monday through Friday jobs, you know, they can sit back at night, uh, sit by the pool or whatever they want to do and, and sit back and relax, have a, have a, have a drink, whatever the drink may be, and, and just kind of relax and chill and, and, and not have to worry about what the world, you know, but when you're, you're in your own business, which is, which is what, what music is, you know, when you're an artist, you're, that's your own, you're self-employed. You've got to take and pay it, even though you've got to have managers and 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 agents and all this that do things for you. You still got to get out there and do the things that they they set up. And it's when other people are off. So mm-hmm. when people when normal people will have their nights and the weekends off to sit back and chill by the pool or whatever, you're out there working because that's the time that people can get out there and pay their money to go see you in a concert. So there's a lot of things that you have to take and and really think about. You know, when you start thinking about, do you want to take and try and climb that ladder of success in the music business? And, you know, I mean, I love music and and I uh, I've been on the road and I've done all that. But, you know, I wouldn't go back to that now, you know, because because even though I'm self-employed, I still take a lot of phone calls nights and weekends. I still have a lot of things that I've got to do, but I still do have some time that I can set aside and say, okay, this is my downtime and I can just chill. Whereas when I was out there performing and when I was out there, you know, recording with other people, if they called and needed me to go on the road, it's like, okay, you know, and you, and they, and you, they off you go. So it's a, it's a completely different lifestyle and people have to really, really want it and understand that there's going to be sacrifices along the way to get it. Excellent. You brought up some great points. I was wondering how had the pandemic affected your creative process and the work that you were doing. There's um there's two two stages of that. The first one is the pandemic pretty much destroyed the music industry for quite a while, and it's still trying to dig out. I mean, because it destroyed everything worldwide. But like at that time, I was managing a few few people. You know, Bobby Wilson, you know, Jackie Wilson's son, and we had all these shows, and and they all went just went away. Uh, and then other people I was working with, uh, their shows went away. Friends of mine that that were on the road, session players that that went on the road with with people like B.J. Thomas and people like that, all their shows went away. So it destroyed the entertainment. And then because I was working with Donnie Most at the time, Star of Happy Days, and all he does um, uh, theater, movies, TV, and records. Everything he was doing went away. I mean, it affected everything never seen anything like it in my life but with that said while the pandemic was going on it is kind of it kind of led to the resurgence of what i'm doing you know which is kind of crazy because I never saw it coming i decided that i was going to record my own cd just for the fun of it just to have something to do and i did and that's what led into the why not me for the first responders and now the why not me for you know the autism support so it had two different levels it it, cre- it created something for me but it took a lot away from from me and everybody that i worked with and even today i mean i've got friends of mine that that do doo-wop shows and oli shows and and all these all these venues that they would go in and sell out they're lucky to get 50 to 60 percent capacity because a lot of the people that go to those shows, which are, you know, the older demographics 
have decided and they got used to staying at home so they don't go out that much so it's uh, but yet you go and and look at uh, like here just just a few few weeks ago taylor swift came in and she sold out nissan stadium three nights in a row sixty five thousand people so she had over one hundred eighty thousand people in three days you know so it's it's been such a wide spread of of people doing good and people not so good and it just really it really hurt the hurt the business quite a lot and you mentioned that people are still digging out do you feel like you're still digging out or have you reached a level that you're comfortable with uh, you know, I'm not as busy production wise as I was pre pandemic. I'm doing OK. I mean, I'm still working with, you know, Debbie Campbell and, you know, Glenn Campbell's daughter and, and Donnie Most. Happy days. Uh, uh, I've got, you know, a couple other people I do do, you know, productions and different things for, you know, so I'm I'm OK, you know, but I'm not as busy as I was pre pandemic. But, you know, I, I can live with it. I'm not. I'm not uh, I'm not crying at all because it's things have slowed down a little bit because because I'm busy doing other things. I'm doing a lot of these podcasts. I've started my own podcast, all these other things that I didn't anticipate doing. And I probably would not have been doing them now if it hadn't been for the pandemic, because it's just the way that it worked out. But to say that I'm back to where it was before, I'm not because because a lot of your I, I work with a lot of independents. And what a lot of people do not understand that independent musicians, singers, they're their own business. So lots of times and and in in major label situations, the major label will pay for the production of the of the singer, but the singer has to pay back the the major label in in uh, what they put into it through sales of the CD, through uh, merchandise through shows, you know, so they're always paying it back. It's just the difference is that they'll let the major label pay for it up front. Whereas with independent labels, you've got a different scenario where they've either either got sponsors or investors or whatever that will help them build their own business. So because I deal with, with I don't deal with, with, I don't do the major label projects because I've I've worked with you know all the people that I've worked with. So what I do is I, I I'm a developer. I will develop and pitch the labels. I'll develop, and if they've got investors that want to or sponsors, I'll put them out to radio. I don't. I'm not as affected as much as 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 you might think. But on the other hand, uh, because they weren't performing for for a, a period of time, because they weren't doing all this, they weren't selling CDs. They were, hit their pocketbooks pretty substantially so they're still digging out so the money isn't there like it was to do a lot of the projects that people were doing because because the pandemic just shut it down it it sounds like it sort of forced people to creatively think outside the box not only about their projects but about what they want to do and what they value and what they're willing to push for well it did i mean i mean it's um it's a situation of where you have to really think about how bad do I want this? You know, do I, am I willing to give up this to, because it's this trade-offs on everything. Like I, like I said earlier, you know, there's certain things that you've got to compromise on and there's certain sacrifices that you have to do to become an artist because of the pandemic. People had to start really thinking about, they couldn't go out and spend their, their uh, money that they was making performing on productions and, and, and reinvesting in themselves because they didn't have any shows. So at that point it was survival. It was take the money and pay the rent and, and make sure food's on the table rather than do productions and reinvest into what you think you could do if you, if you got a break and, and started making into, into the music business. So it really hurt the smaller artists the major label artists, the ones that have already made it, that have done really well over the years, it didn't affect them hardly at all. It just it it just stopped them performing. But people like Taylor Swift, like Reba, you know, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, you can just you can just name the people off that are the big time people. Yeah, it affected them because they weren't performing, but they didn't change their lifestyle. But your your smaller, medium sized, you know. Uh, singers and artists out there that were just on the cusp of of doing something big, it hurt them. The ones that were growing to get that to that point, 
it hurt them. So it really hurt a lot of people. Um, and now, I mean, I see where it's starting to pick up again. It's starting to build. Uh, people are getting shows, but it's just not, it devastated the inter industry. This, it just hurt every level and every part of the music business that you can think of for the smaller individuals across the country. Sort of piggybacking on that, you know, what is a stereotype about, you know, being in the music industry that you hope you have broken or hope to break with your work? The, the biggest thing that I try and do is I'm not one of these producers that, that works with anybody that comes into Nashville. There are production people out there that if you come into Nashville and you've got some money and you want to spend it with them, they will tell you anything that you want to hear to get you your business. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I'm very selective. Uh, I don't work with just anybody. Uh, I want to help those that really are serious about it really understand the pitfalls that they can get themselves into if it doesn't work out. Those that have a plan B in case it doesn't work out. I want to give people real information and give them the reality of what the music business is if they decide to get into it or if they decide to try and go to that next level. So I'm not, if somebody comes to me and says, what do you think my chances are of making it to a major label and making a career out of this? I'm not going to tell them you don't have any chance because they do. But I'm just not going to paint that rosy picture, picture and tell them that, hey, come work with me and I'll make you a star because it doesn't work that way. You've got a there's a development process. It used to be the major labels would, if they liked the singer, they would get in there, they would develop, and then they'd spend all this money. And then at the end of it, if it worked out, they'd take them to radio. They're not doing that as much now. They're they're looking at people like me that do production and development to do all that legwork for them. And then once they get it going, then they'll pick them up and keep it going. So it's a completely different scenario than what it used to be. I mean, I remember one time, like when Mindy McCready first made it, they took her into RCA's office with Joe Galante. They sat down with a guitar player and her, played a few songs, listened to it, and then Galante said, well, you know, let's see if we can't make a deal. They, they liked her. The chances of that happening today, it could, but chances are it won't because it's not that kind of business. They want me to present them a full-blown production that is ready to go to radio, and all they have to do is pick it up and say, yeah, we like it, let's make a deal, and then this is the first song that, that we're going to release. So it's a completely different scenario now than what it used to be. Is it good? Yeah, you know, some people like it, some people don't. You know, some people, they said the same thing 20 years ago. You know, so it's just changed. It's evolved. When anything evolves, we have to either evolve with it or we left get left behind. So I've never changed. I've always been a production development. When I first started out, I was just just production development. Then in 2005, I turned my production development company into, a, into an independent le record label, Plateau Music. And then from there, I started releasing singers and, and taking them to radio and, and getting them in the charts and trying to build them you know, opportunities to get you know, more radio airplay, to get out there and get performances. It was a development process. 30 years ago, you know, the major labels would do that. They would develop somebody. If, if somebody made... You know, if, if they put out a singer and they sold, say, 100,000 CDs, and back then it was albums, they would go, oh, man, that is so great. We didn't sell enough to make money on you, but we really made a, an imprint, so ne maybe the next one will do better. And then once they, once they built that artist up, they had, a, they had a fan base on that artist for life. Then it all changed. Then they started going after the teenage country you know, fan. And then it started becoming a, what have you done for me today? Not what you did for me yesterday. So if you hadn't had a hit record today, but somebody else does, they could jump from the one that they like to this new one and move on with them. And then when they don't have a hit record, they jump onto somebody else and it's ever changing. So those lifelong fans like Johnny Cash and, and some of the, some of the Loretta Lynn and people like that had, those are gone. 
you know, you don't have those lifelong fans anymore in the country, country music side. And because of that, it's, it's kind of hurt the business, you know, but the major labels evolved and they, they built it. And now if a, if a singer puts out a record out there and it only does a hundred thousand, you know, CDs or whatever, they may not have a record label anymore. They could just drop them tomorrow here today, gone tomorrow. They'll jump onto the new one. So it's an ever evolving, ever changing business. And now it's got to the, it's got to the point where if an up and coming singer uh, is doing something, they better make sure that they're working with somebody that understands the business, how it works, how it evolves so that they've got somebody that can give them good guidance because one bad move, you could be toast. That is very, that is very interesting to hear about, especially because that's not, you know, that's not something that's in my immediate world at all, you know? Well, it's not what's perceived. I tell every artist that I work with, perception is reality. You know, if people perceive that you are this, whether you are or you are not, you are, because that's what they think you are. When you're out there trying to create a name for yourself, create a style for yourself, develop yourself into something that could be a good singer at radio that people would like, you better watch everything that you do because with social media out there, you say the wrong thing, you're toast. You you do the wrong thing and somebody videos you, you're toast. I mean, there are so many things that can cause you to lose your deal or lose your fan base. So you've got to be very, very careful in what you do, what you say, and how you put yourself out there. So the perception is one that you can hopefully get a larger amount of the audience that will like you. So you're never going to have 10 out of 10 people that's going to like you. But if you can get six out of 10, you've done good. If you can get seven out of 10, you've done good. You know, so you've just always got to take and keep that that little sliver of uh, reality in your mind that you just can't go out there and be this big time guy and act like you're like you're this or you're that. Because if you tick off the wrong person, then all of a sudden it gets all over social media, becomes really big, and then you've lost everything you've worked for. So you have to be very careful. It's a different world now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and you'd mentioned social media. And I know, especially during the pandemic, you know, there were some people who were discovered, you know, like dancers or artists and musicians. And I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on how that's moving forward where people are, you know, putting snippets and videos up? Do people still get discovered that way? Well, you know... I went to a I went to a meeting one time. The speaker got up there, and this is a long, long time ago. And I use this saying even today. There's possibilities and there's probabilities. The possibility is that you could put something out there, you could go wild, and then all of a sudden you're a superstar, making all kinds of money. The probability is slim, but you can never say that it's impossible. So I will never say that anybody goes out and does social media and tries to do all this has no chance because they do. But what is the reality of that chance? Slim to none. You know, that's probably where it's at, but you know, you might be the slim. You never know when you're the one I tell people don't go out there and try and, and buy a ticket to the lottery and expect to win. Because you've got so many people out there that are trying to do exactly the same thing that you're doing. And what makes you that special? That you're going to outshine all of them. You've got to have something that is unique. You've got to have something that is, that is, that is yourself. But that's hard to do because pretty much everything's been done now. So what you have to do is go out there and do what you do and do it well. Do it so good that people pay attention to you. Even if it sounds a little bit like this person or that person, you can say, well, you know, that person influenced me, but I'm still me, you know, and then you create your own style, you create your own abilities, and you hopefully create your own entourage that will follow you. But there's no guarantees of that. So because there's no guarantees, you can't count on it. You know, so you've got to go out there and you've got to have a plan. You got to follow that plan. And then hopefully the plan gets expedited because you get lucky or you get or you, you find the right person that gets behind you or you know whatever the case may be but it, it just 
elevates you at a quicker pace than what you thought. But at least you have that plan, you're following the plan. And then if it goes faster, that's great. But if it doesn't, stick to the plan because the plan has an op gives you an opportunity to have success. And in the end, that's really all that any singer, songwriter, actor, actress, anybody that's in the entertainment field, that's all they can ask for is, did I have an opportunity for success with what I was doing? And that kind of takes me back to what I told you earlier, that we have to make, when an artist goes out there, you've got to look at the person you're going to work with and look at their background. Check them out. Do your homework. Make sure these people are what they say they are and can do what they say they can do. Because ultimately, lots of times, you only get one shot at doing it. You don't get three strikes. And like in baseball, you get one shot. You get that one shot. You want to make the most of it. And then if it works, great. It worked. You're on your way. If it doesn't work, then you have to sit back and say, okay, what do I need to do to change to give me a better opportunity? And do I still have an opportunity? At the end of a career, no matter what that career is, a year, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter how long it is. It only matters that whatever that career is, is did you have an opportunity to have success? If you had that opportunity and it didn't happen, you can at least sit back and say, okay, I gave it my best shot and I'm proud of what I did. But if you didn't have an opportunity because you're working with the wrong people, then you're always going to have that sitting in the back of your mind is like, what would have happened if I really had somebody that could have given me an opportunity? So that's why I tell everybody, make sure you do your homework, check everybody out, make sure that they are what they say they are, because this is such a business that you don't get many shots at success. So when you do get that shot, you at least want to have it be your best opportunity. I really love that. We're going to do a few more questions before we wrap up. But one of them is a fun one, which is... If you could have dinner with any creative person, living or dead, who would it be? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. There's actually two people. I, I loved Elvis. I loved his style, his charisma. And I loved Karen Carpenter. You know, because they both had such talent and they both were taken away so early in life. It, it would have been nice just to sit down and just hang out and, and just, you know, have a drink with them no matter what it is and and just shoot the breeze and relax. I think they, you know, the stories and just everything would be pretty interesting. That would be really great. And uh, one final question, in your own words, what does living a creative life mean to you? Well, creativity has so many different connotations. When people think of creativity, you know, some people think of creativity in the music business. Uh, some people think of about, about it in, in acting or movies. There are so many creative people around this world that create so many great things, whether it be automobiles, uh, uh, you know, drawings, anything that uh, architecture, you know, when, when they start out with a piece of land, then all of a sudden uh, a year later, you've got a skyscraper on it. I mean, that's all creative. I really think that that it comes down to people that have a vision for what they want to do what they see can happen, what they see that other people don't see. I think that that uh, speaks volumes and that's a great creative process. And I think anyone that has that vision, no matter what it is and that they're creating, you know, they need a pat on the back and, and uh, you know, support to have them have the best shot that they can to turn that creative thing that they thought about into a reality. That is really great to think about. Excellent. Well, Tony, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, no problem. I appreciate you having me. You're welcome. And listeners, please check the show notes for links to Tony's website where you can find his bio and also links for his podcast, which will be launching at the end of June. So as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for creative 
Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.